Welcome again to Yes, We're Here. I'm Jack Curry, and today I'm joined by the great Don Mattingly. Currently, he's the manager of the Marlins. He was an MVP with the Yankees. He was a captain with the Yankees. He was the provider of many memorable moments with the Yankees. And Donnie, before I get started, I need to ask you, how are you and your family doing during these challenging times? No, we're doing okay. Obviously, we're like, you know, a lot of uh, people in the world and, and uh, America just, you know, trying to do our part with the quarantine, trying to, you know, stay healthy, flatten the curve. Obviously, I'm here in Indiana, so it's a lot different than, you know, what we see on the news in, in New York. And, and really, Jack, if, I'm, if I can, I just want to send a thank you out to all the people that are out there just working and on the front lines. And I know we talk about the healthcare workers, and obviously we should, but so many people in supply chains and truck drivers that are, you know, bringing food all over the country, and people are still picking up trash. And there's people out there working for us, right, as we – try to do that and you're always thankful for that um you know for those people so just a shout out and thank you well i think that's a very appropriate way to start this and i think all new yorkers and anyone who is dealing with this would thank you for acknowledging them because you're right we need to stay safe stay positive and try and make sure that we all get through this together you're one of 30 men managing a baseball team right now that you don't have any face-to-face -face contact with. I'm sure there's some virtual contact. How do you handle that? How do you stay in touch with guys and try to keep yourself as close to them as possible during these times of uncertainty? Well, Derek, Derek and I think owner, our ownership has did a great job of, of keeping everyone connected uh, from the bottom of our organization right to the top. Uh, we have meetings every week uh, with our major league staff and then each each there's a member, obviously, your coaching staff is staying in touch with their hitters, staying in touch with their pitchers, your catchers, uh, trying to do different things with video that we can send out to guys to help help them, you know, moving forward. But in general, you're just trying to stay in touch, stay connected, uh, keep those guys on the right track uh, as much as possible. So it, there's ways to do it, uh, but we're all kind of in the same boat, right? We're home, and after a while, you're like two or three weeks of that, you know, they're trying to just stay healthy and, and fill the time. When you flash back to early February, before the coronavirus suspended operations, you've got a team coming off a season in which it won 57 games. You've got a lot of young players, a lot of opportunities. What was your message to the Marlins about making 2020 a different season? No, I think my message was, was simple. It's time. Uh, as I sat on the plane last year, late in the year, and knowing the season we had, it, it was a rough season. There were some good things that happened uh, as far as our young pitchers, you know, getting that experience. And so our message was it's time, right? A lot of our, our top prospects are at that double AA, A, triple A level. We're going to have young starting pitching that has, you know, basically a year uh, of major league experience under its belt. We went out and signed some free agents to help us offensively. Um, and it's just time to make that move. We've been building for two years. That part's been rough. Again, Derek's message, ownership's message has been, we're going to build this thing from the bottom up. Uh, our organization, I think, has went from 28th or 29th in the minor leagues to, I think, in the top three or four. So our talent level from the trades and things we've done uh, is really starting to surface. You can see it. You can feel it in camp. So the message basically was, it's time. To, to make that move. You coached for the Yankees, you managed for the Dodgers, you now managed for the Marlins. But I want to go back to when you were a player. You, you played for Pinella, Barra, Dallas Green, Buck Showalter. What part of any of those guys is inside of you as a manager? Or, or are there a lot of things that you poached from some of the guys you played for? Oh, I poached from all of them and played with, right? I think you do it as a player when you're coming up. I was fortunate to come up with you know, Lou Pinella and Bobby Mercer and Goose and uh, mm -hmm. Willie Endoff, Ron Guidry. I mean, just numerous guys that you, you take the good, right, that you want to be. That's part of you. And the same with managers, from Billy Martin to Yogi. And as you mentioned, there was lots of them from Buck, uh, Lou. I mean, Dal, everyone, right? You take from everyone uh, what you want, right, and what you want to be. And so those – 
that's how you you form your opinions and in in your beliefs. Donnie, when I flash back to 1995, I, I told Paul O'Neill this recently. That team finished its season 26 and seven. Even the Yankee teams that later went on to win World Series, I'm not sure they had a must win mentality in the way that that team had. What do you remember about that dash to the postseason? I remember you in Toronto when it finally happened, leaning down and just just taking your fist on the AstroTurf, like, finally, I'm finally there. Right. You know what? That was, that was probably those, – those teams were probably as much fun as I had playing because we kind of had went through that period where it, there were some rough, lean years. And to be coming out of that – and after the, the strike in 94, the way we were playing in that group, in 95, we just couldn't get it going. And it seemed like we were getting down to the wire, you know, getting down to that last month, that minute run. And I remember just saying, hey, we got to win every day. You know, we got to think like we got to win every day. And that was probably as much fun as I had playing because you're in that NCAA tournament mode of like, hey, we can't afford to lose. And, and we played like that, and that was so much fun. And, uh, you know, going down the stretch and playing like that is something that you really never forget. You play this epic five-game series against the Seattle Mariners, end up losing that game five in excruciating fashion. I remember being in the clubhouse in the Kingdom. You spoke for 45 minutes, and there was a strange sense of contentment in your answers as almost, I got here. I got here. It didn't end up the way that I wanted it to, but I got here. And I remember leaving the clubhouse that night with other reporters, Michael Kay, Joel Sherman, John Heyman. And we all sort of had the belief, this is the end. He may not announce it right now, but you could see in his demeanor that he had gotten there, he had tasted it, and now it was probably time to walk away. Obviously, our intuition was correct. What do you remember about all of that? Well, I remember it not feeling content after that, that game. I feel feeling pain after that game. That was a tough series. And I know they've been playing those games, that game five here on the MLB network. And it's like, I do not want to watch that at all. But um, you're, you're right. I, I knew, I really thought 94 was going to be my last year. Uh, but when the strike came, I couldn't, couldn't finish like that. Uh, I had a pretty good sense uh, just from the standpoint of my, you know, where my kids were at, the time of their life. Uh, they were not coming back to New York. Uh, they were staying home, playing Little League, uh, you know, didn't want to leave that. And, you know, I remember telling myself during that year, I still love playing and love being around the guys. But even when we were in New York, I was getting to be like I was on the road. Mm. It was almost like I was going to the ballpark and going back home, going to the ballpark and going back home. Found myself earlier to the ballpark every day you know, two o'clock, and then it's like, huh, I'm getting here so early, right? Because I didn't have, you know, it was just like, that's the only place I was happy. Um, and so I knew it was at that time, right? And, um, you know, I, and so I was content from the standpoint, I was happy that I was able to get to the playoffs, uh, get that shot to play, um, not content, not obviously not getting a chance to win a World Series. I had a chance to win a World Series, but didn't, didn't get there. Um, but I just knew it was the right time for my family. And it was something that if I tried to keep playing, I was going to regret it. And uh, so that's where I was at. Don, your teammates talk about your competitiveness, your dedication, how much you wanted to win. I just wanted to run two anecdotes past you. One, I know you've heard before. Derek Jeter, who's now one of your bosses, talks about being in the minor leagues. You're on a backfield. Nobody's around. The workout is over. And on the way back to the clubhouse, which is 400, 500 feet away, you said to him, let's run. We need to run because you never know who's watching. And Derek said from a young age, you told him that was the right way to do things. And recently, Mariano Rivera told me he had a locker near you in 95, and all he did was watch you. Because through osmosis and the way you had your routines and the way you interacted with people, he learned what it was like to be a major league player. When you hear two players who became Hall of Famers, Talk about that impact you had when they were so young. How gratifying is that? Well, obviously, you're, you are honored when guys like that uh, look to the way you, you did things. Um, but it, it's funny when you're playing, I kind of go to the Charles Barkley thing, you know, we're not role models. Um, 
Which is, you know, in a, in a sense, there's truth to that. You know, kids shouldn't be watching just athletes, but I think you can't deny as athletes that we all are in some way. And I think you want to be, you, you know, you want to be respected by your teammates and your peers. And I think that's, I just went about my business, getting ready to play, trying to win a game every day, try to treat people right. I think I learned that from my father. You treat people with respect, uh, no matter if they're young or old or whatever it is, if it's the guy at the door or whoever it is. And that's the way I try to go about it and not try to think about leaving something more than just being myself and, and doing the right thing. You mentioned Charles Barkley. I have to ask you because I know you're a big hoops fan and you were a captain and you were a leader and you were a guy who was in clubhouses. And I'm sure there were times where you did have to have a testy exchange with a teammate. Have you watched Last Dance with Michael Jordan and what have you thought of some of the behind the scenes footage and, and the way he guided those Bulls teams? I lo I've, I've watched probably every moment of it and I've loved it. Uh, he reminds me of Derek a lot. You know, it reminds me of Derek in the way that will to win. Uh, and some of the behind the scenes is, 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 to me, is the most interesting thing about, for me, it's not the, the athletes themselves, it's behind the scenes. It's the same with like being able to go backstage and watch an artist work and watch people work in that scenario. And that's, that's really cool to get that window to look at that. So I, I've been watching it, I love it. Um, it's kind of like a, you feel like at the end, right? And, I, and I, I, I lived a little bit of this where Michael didn't want to leave the hotel room, right? And I felt like that the last probably couple of years of my career where it was like, he didn't really leave the hotel until it was time to go to the field. And because you couldn't really walk around without like, and relax. It was like the only place to really relax is in your room. And uh, that's kind of how I, I lived that way my last two or three years of playing. So that part of uh, that with Michael, I was like, he, you, could, you, could, you knew exactly what he was feeling. Don, you've been autographing some items for Mattingly Charities recently. I want you to tell us who it benefits and how people can help out and be a part of it and where they can find the information. Well, mattinglycharities.org is, is what, what we were able to do it through. And there's a, a top uh, set of cards that are coming out. Uh, it's the 2020, I forgot exactly what they call it, but there's only gonna, there's gonna be 20 cards. And I, don't, I think there's maybe 20 players that they're doing. They're taking your rookie card and like special artists are creating their own version of that card. Um, yeah, so I, we, we sold that card everything goes to Mattingly Charities. Uh, but it was really cool because we put them on and I think we sold like 190 cards in like 15 minutes or something, which was really kind of cool. Uh, but it's a cool set, right? And to, to be able to do something like that uh, and really going to put out a video here in, in the next couple of days, just thanking our, our followers because it's really cool uh, of what happened yesterday. Mattinglycharities.org. We will make sure that we promote that. Before I let you go, one final question. I'm going to take you into the future now. 50 years from now, there's an older fan who saw you play, and he's approached by a younger fan who's not familiar with Don Mattingly's career. And he says to the older fan, who was this guy? What should I know about him? What would you want or hope that the older fan would say about your career and who you were? Uh I would hope that he would say, hey, this was a guy that played the game right, played hard every day, uh, worried more about winning than anything else. Uh, that's what, you know, I wanted to stand for. I wanted to go out and, and do my best every day. I always looked at it. I love playing. Uh, looked at it as a responsibility to the fans and to my family to give my best effort every day uh, and just tried to do that. And there's days you, you don't feel like you lived up to that. Uh, but obviously it's something that I tried to do. As someone who covered you, I, I can concur that that absolutely was the case. Don, we really appreciate you giving us some time today, and we look forward to the day that we can see you back in a dugout, we can see baseball back, and that everyone's back to some sense of normalcy. Yeah, thanks, Jack. I'm with you on that. I'd uh, love to see get a little bit more sense of normalcy for everyone, uh, and appreciate you, you having me on today.